Hey, everybody. This is Kristen V. Carter with the Trust Your Magic podcast. And as you can see, I am here with a very special guest, my very dear best friend, sister from another mister, Sabrine Sharif. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me. (laughs) This is really interesting. This is really cool. First of all, you haven't been in L.A. in how long? Four or five years, I think. The last time you were here was because I had a surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, you've always been here for every single important moment. So I just want to acknowledge that. <laughs> I'd like to show up. Show up um, so first of all, just to bring it back, guys, I've known Sabrine, what, 32 years? That sounds about right. Yes. 32 years. 1992? I have, yes. I have known you since the second grade. And so, um, yeah, I want to find out a little bit. I have my story about how we met. But how would you say we met? Um, well, obviously, we met in the second grade. I remember you being a very sweet and talkative and confident girl in our class. Um, I do. I think you just, you've been the Kristen since I met you. (laughs) And I was like, who is this interesting person? She's just telling jokes and laughing to herself. I enjoy your brand of comedy. Let's hang out. See, I feel like you are telling a fib because when I got into class, I was, I remember being in the back. I was like flipping my chair back and forth and trying to give out pencils to people and whatnot. And I remember seeing you with Iphigenie Lovely mm-hmm. <laughs> and being like, I want to be Sabrine's friend. She's got to get rid of all her other friends. <laughs> well, I wasn't there for the scheming phase of it, but I, re- I remember you giving out stuff like you're just open and the rocking and, you know, enjoying yourself in the back of class is not something that I would see myself doing at the time. I think I was more reserved. You've always been more performative, more (laughs) bombastic, I think. And I I like that. That's hilarious. This is interesting because you've been here for it all. And I think this is the very first time we both have been on camera together. Definitely. (laughs) On purpose, at least. Yeah. So how are you feeling, first of all? Um, I feel good. Okay. I feel okay. good. I'm happy to be here. Good, good, good. So I wanted you to be a part of this podcast because single handedly, you are the one person that has always been here for everything. And I would consider you an unsung hero as it comes to my life and our family's lives. We've been through a lot together. So I just want to go all the way back. I'll say that people see us and think that we've never been through things and we've been through a lot. So I just want to kind of talk us back through, you know, second grade up until I want to say like middle school. So tell me a little bit about how you were brought up and just some of the things that you went through when we were younger. Very loving home. My mom and dad were involved parents, just as your mom was involved parents in school. Got to do a lot of activities, got to be excited about about school and I think be fully a child. Like I don't think that there were early on, I don't think there were any worries And when we first met, at least from my perspective, and I remember just that pure joy and just being fully, you know, involved in whatever programs we were involved in. We were involved in IG Mm -hmm. when you get to be, you're like, I'm a gifted kid. You just accept all of the positivity that's coming into you. And I think our parents radiated that into us. Um, And that was great. And then up until the end of elementary school, I know you moved around a A lot, lot, (laughs) a lot, but For me, it seemed like you were always consistently there. And I think that was because you are an astute pen pal. You were like a professional. (laughs) Keep in touch. You know, people say it, but you meant it. So I think that you you and your mom were very um, instrumental in making sure that our our young friendship got to cultivate. And uh, I appreciate you for that. I just want to say that (laughs) because I I feel like we would have missed out if you weren't so diligent in keeping in touch. No, it's funny. I appreciate that. So like there are special people that we all come across and we talk about all talk about that all the time. So when we were growing up, uh, my mom was PTA president, Mm -hmm. even though I was in Madison Avenue school for just a blip. Um, I might have been in your class, what, all of four months before moving. Was it really that short? It was a little bit more, maybe a little bit more than half the school year. So I got so basically I transferred to Madison Avenue school. I came in the middle of fall. You have been in Madison for years. Mm -hmm. And I think I was in your class. Yeah, I would say two semesters. I skipped, went to another school, and then we stayed in touch. But in all of that, that's that's a lot. In all of that, my mom was a PTA president for a short time. Our parents did like different nights with us. I think we did like a talent night together. Mm -hmm. And 
all of that. And then I also remember the fact that like I lived in Marshall Street Apartments, which I guess would we consider that the Irvington Projects? Would we consider that? I mean, yeah, kind of. Kind of yeah, right. <laughs> so growing up, I always looked at you guys, your your parents, you you had a house. It was both your mom and dad. I literally would like come over to watch like your family because I was like, oh my gosh, Sabrine has parents. Like I had never, I didn't know that concept because I always just had me and my mom. Mm-hmm. And um, when you guys would sleep over, we would be in my bunk beds. Like I think, yeah, we would be in my bunk beds in our little uh, studio apartment and we just always had a good time. And it's so funny that you said this to me before that looking at my family, it seemed different, but you didn't seem, you never seemed without. Mm. So I felt the same love that was at my house. I felt it when I went to stay over um, with with you and your mom and, and Nana, in the Marshall Street Apartments. Like I felt the same degree of at home there. So I'm just grateful that maybe that I just wasn't paying attention because I didn't realize you were experiencing that at the, a young age. I just thought we're just friends having fun. We're just going back and forth. This like none of it, none of it that was really significant really registered with me until later, I think. Later when? I would say maybe even middle school, I got to be more reflective. I always was appreciative of the moment, but I didn't really understand how great it was until, you know, things started to change. Yeah. I moved away. Well, yeah, I changed schools. I stayed in Marshall Street Apartments and then I moved to Sayreville. Your parents made sure that they would move. And just so you guys know, Sayreville is about, what, 45 minutes away? It's it's really like 35 minutes, but it but felt it's like... So far. <laughs> it, it felt like you had to catch an Uber and then get a donkey and then transfer. <laughs> it felt really far. And in elementary school, like those friendships, it's so easy for your friendship to just fizzle out. Yeah, like no one thinks about like when you're six or seven years old, like, oh, okay, I'm going to keep in touch. But I was... Hell bent or keeping it, <laughs> keeping in touch and writing letters. And I think our parents were really, really instrumental in just making sure that we stayed close as well. Um, what do you think was different about our friendship before we even get into any of our hardships? Like, what do you feel like was special or different about our friendship at the time? I think um, I think it was just a pure love. And I think that what really what really anchored us is that our parents had a relationship yeah. Our parents were friends as well. So it was much easier to help. We're all friends together. This is a family friendship. I think that was instrumental in us being able to be ourselves and stay stay yeah. connected. So by the time we got to middle school, my mom had been engaged and we ended up moving. She got married. Like there was a lot of, I want to say transition for me. And I know there was a lot of transition for you as well. Um you know, unfortunately, your mom passed at mm-hmm. when we were really young. Yeah. And um, we still stayed close through that. And I'm just curious to know, I don't even know if we've talked about it, like what was going through your mind at that time, um, just in terms of who you were as a young girl? I think that if, if kids can have an identity crisis, I think I definitely was. But the people that helped me to be anchored were obviously my dad, my grandparents. But your mom as well, because I remember her, I remember like, it's, it's almost like watching a movie. I remember images of your mom being there for me silently. Mm. And, um, you know, I'm not a kind of person that is verbally emotional, but I feel things deeply. And I think that the people that are around me, yourself included, like just because we, it's, we interact with the world differently, like you still hold space for me. And I think that that was instrumental in that. And I think that um, that time frame, like sixth, seventh, eighth, maybe even ninth grade, it was just such a strange, there's so much happening in your life if everything's going correctly or as, you know, as, as it's designed to be. And I think I felt it even more intensely, but I felt like I was almost being washed away. But there were so many people that were just being touchstones for me uh, that really helped me navigate my way through that. When you say washed away, because I know how I felt just um, like I mentioned, having the image of what I felt perfect parents were um, in your parents and just almost the silence. Like we would hang out and it was like an unspoken thing, yeah. you know, because we were young. Um, but when you say washed away, what do you, what do you mean by that? I think that 
even as a kid, I think the way that you looked at like, oh, like they're a really happy family. We were like, that was a hundred percent true. Yeah. And I think that, um, I saw the world differently and there was so much more possibility in a kind of a scary way that I wasn't aware of until then. Yeah. One thing like that we always, I think really enjoyed was watching movies and around that time, just all of that transition, we used to watch Crooklyn faithfully. Yes. Because I always saw you pretty much as Troy. And um, and if you guys haven't seen Crooklyn, you have to see it. Spike mm-hmm. Lee joint, of course. Um, that movie and then also Now and Then. Mm-hmm. What do you remember most about that time in terms of just even pulling through? You're a middle child, but you and I feel you ended up really being a matriarch of your family. How were you even able to do that at like 12 and 13? You know, I don't, I don't know that I was ever not training for that. Like that's just what the women in my family, my, my dad has been a strong figure in my life up until today, this morning and still, and continuing on, you know, but women in my family, especially on my mom's side, I just saw that generationally you just always are, looking after somebody and maybe not even looking after looking out for Mm -hmm. just like bring people in, just make sure everybody's okay. Um, And it seemed like it was a joy to do that. So I just kind of leaned into that. Yeah. Yeah. We both come from four generations, Mm -hmm. you know, having mom, grandmother, great grandmother, and then ourselves. I had granny for a short time, my great, great grandmother. So we come from like a rich I think well of Mm -hmm. just matriarchs, motherhood, women, all of that. And when I think of support, when I think of what it means to be like, you're not a mother, but I feel like you've mothered so many people uh, or been sister to so many people. We had a friend group called the triangle. (laughs) And so around the time that we were going through our 12 and 13 years Like we said, you had gone through a major transition. I had gone through a major transition with my mom getting married uh, and divorced quickly. And then also I went to boarding school. And I'll never forget, I think the night before, I was chasing you and your dad's car. (laughs) Shout out to Papa Sass. But I was chasing the car because all I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. All I wanted was to make sure that our friendship stayed intact. I didn't even care. I was like, man, school is what it is. I just want to make sure that I remain close with my friends. Like, what was going on in your head <laughs> at that time? I think, um, one, and I think you're wearing your mom's shoes when you came outside too. <laughs> um, I think that I, I was aware that it felt like so much was happening all at once. It felt like being pulled in different directions. Yeah. I, w- I had the same uncertainty when you went away to school. It was different than moving away to a different town because this is just you on your own. I, said, I, I didn't know how we would still continue to fit. And I didn't realize that I was even thinking that. Yeah. Because, you know, again, seventh and eighth grade, 12, 13 years old, you're trying to figure out what's what's the next version of you. You're not no you're no longer a little kid. You're not really a big kid. You're you're and you're not a teenager. You're this this amorphous blob of anxiety, (laughs) not blob (laughs) blob of anxiety with skin issues and. (laughs) <laughs> trying to figure out where you fit in, getting where you fit in. Man, like I remember <laughs> so much uh, those summers at NJIT and, you know, we would go skating. We would stay up and watch Apollo. We would do so many different fun things. And then when I went away, I felt like I'm not going to fit in with my friends anymore. And I can identify that I'm almost 40 and I can identify with that feeling today. Like mm-hmm. right now, just even thinking about, um, man, will I fit in with my friends? Will they care? Will they miss me? Will they end up dating people? Like, you know, what's kind of going to happen? Um, so were you, were you thinking the same thing? Yeah, I think so. And I think that um, I, I was worried that you would just find a new version of yourself that you liked even more, to be honest with you, because it was such, a, it's a, it was such an isolating experience, I think, for I know for you, but for all of us as well, because even when we were close and spent summers together. We didn't go to school together as a a triangle. So most of the year you're kind of with other people figuring your way out. And, you know, it's difficult when you're trying to be a consistent version of yourself that you like and not just change because you're in a different group or what something that I thought, I felt like I was playing a character Sabrina sometimes. And I felt like I I was boxing myself in to be a version that, Hmm. well, this is a well-behaved Sabrine, which is me, 
but I didn't know if that was all of me. So it was just yeah. a really interesting time to be transitioning. When I moved, when I moved to Groton, I was 12 years old. And I was writing, I think up a storm and you and Danny were just like not writing at all. Actually, well, I think you guys started to. And then I made an ultimatum. I tried. And then I made an ultimatum. And I was like, if I don't hear from you by like November 1st, we're not, (laughs) we're not friends. And I think Danny's letter came like November 2nd. And I was like, we're still, (laughs) we're still not friends. (laughs) You missed the deadline. You, I mean, you, you have always taken friendship very seriously, very seriously. Like friendship is your ministry, I think. But because from an early age, like, you know, that that's how you, I think that's how you've grounded yourself in moving to a new town or moving wherever I, you find a core group that you fit with, not changing yourself, but that you fit with and you can still be safe. I think friendship is safety, especially when you're young. Yeah. I mean, I think. Like, like we've consistently said, I can list all the schools that I went to. You stayed, you've always been in one house. Mm-hmm. You stayed at Madison, I think, until you graduated there mm-hmm. and then went to Union Avenue. Yep. Yeah. And so for myself, I can list like at a point, I think fourth grade, I had transferred three and four different times. And then by the time I got to Groton, my boarding school, I stayed there all of high school. So during those high school years, I think we were still trying to figure out who we were. And um, I will never forget. I think there was one particular year. It might have been 10th grade. That was when you were like, I'm going to just keep calling and calling and calling. And I said, (laughs) "Okay, Sabrina does love me. (laughs) And then, you know, I think after that, you just know, like, you're going to be a part of my life for the rest of my life. Uh, And it's funny. when 10th grade is when I solidified it. Yeah. I mean, I always felt like we were going to be lifelong friends before then, but I feel like 10th grade, you were relentless. There there was one school year where you kept reaching out because I was like, oh, my friends don't care. Like, whatever. I go home and I feel left out. And you were always trying to make me feel comfortable, but I always felt like the odd man out. Like, no matter where we went, whether it was like skating or hanging out with the Benedicts guys Mm -hmm. and everything, I just always felt like, They've moved on. When I think about those years, even when I think about like shows like Dawson's Creek, they're actually so right on. Like, Mm -hmm. I just think teenage angst is real. And a lot of people don't think about the fact that like you are a set version of yourself at that point. You're trying to figure things out. You're trying to figure out who's down for you and all of that. Um, So you sounded surprised. So when would you say like you knew, okay, like Chris is going to be a part of my life for the rest of my life? I witnessed you do a purge every now and again. I don't ever feel like I'm on the chopping block, but I know, just so you know. This sounds terrible. A refresh, a, a reorg. Is that better? Do you feel better? Reorg? No. Of your, friends, <laughs> your friendship group. But it's just um, just to make sure all the people that are there are still willing and happy and joyful participants. And you're not, you know, a quiet saboteur or somebody well, who's... No. I'm sorry, cut you off, but I do think, like, when you say a quiet saboteur, I think that's true. Like, you have to pay attention to the people who are are around you and who are encouraging you. There were a lot of things that were happening, and I always just felt like you were really encouraging. And then, obviously, we had a friend group change. Mm -hmm. Not to to make light of what you just said, but we did have a friend group change because I didn't necessarily feel that level of support. I always felt like you... Um, were supportive, always encouraging, always had a good word, always willing to laugh and cry. I feel like we've cried so much <laughs> through the years. Um, so Sabrina doesn't dance in public. And so we went away to different colleges. Oh, Lord. And I went to visit her at college and she danced and I was pissed. I was like, <laughs> what a strange reaction. What? What? I've known you for years. I, I knew you like by that point I had known you for like at least 15 years. I was yeah. like, Sabrine's dancing with other people. How why? That's just And you know, I should have said dance is your ministry. Dance is your actual <laughs> ministry. So I understand I didn't get it at the time. I understand more now why you felt that way. Okay, then why did why did I feel that way? Because it's kind of an intimate, it's a free sort of thing. And it's like, is she not free with me? I am free. I am free. I'm comfortable. I'm at home. But I just, you know, I was dabbling in something, okay. which I still don't dance now. I'm near, like, this is decades in. I don't dance in public. <laughs> okay. I don't know why. It's just, okay. it's just who I am. 
obviously, you know, Treasure Magic is all about trusting our gifts and talents. And one thing that I wanted to explore is just like leaps of faith for both of us. And um, they can be things that people feel are big or small or whatever. Um, I know that you have been just incredibly encouraging with some leaps of faith for me. But I would say um, when Trust Your Magic comes to mind, what do you think of about yourself? I think that I've learned, and I would say even in the last five years, I think is where I've had a, a great deal of growth for myself in being able to root for myself the way I root for other people. Uh, honestly, I think it's really easy to root for you. Like it's, I've been doing it for many years because I love you. I admire you. I think you do a lot of great things. I don't, I don't see, I mean, I see the, the effort it takes, but it has never occurred to me that you wouldn't do all the things that you want to do. It just seems obvious for me. I think that I've had to spend more time being patient with myself, being kind to myself and just allowing myself to try things. And I think trusting my magic has made me put myself in more uncomfortable situations that will force me to grow. And it's, and it's felt really good. It's felt good to be a little bit off balance and to regain my balance. Yeah. That makes sense. um, When you mentioned the uncomfortable situations, I don't even know what those would be. Like, what are you referring to? For the most part, professionally, just putting myself in for things that maybe I'm only 60% qualified for because I, I know I can learn, learn it, realizing I'm capable of learning the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is that you want is possible. You know, all the things that I admire are skills. It's not even, it's magic, but it's more so effort and diligence and, you know, making connections. And I, and I realize that I can do all of those things. So I can do whatever else I want to do. Just mm-hmm. applying that pressure in a good way to myself. Just do it. Okay. 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 You know? Um, yeah. When I think of when I think of leaps of faith and the leaps of faith that you you've been a part of, I would say absolutely the trip here to LA. Um, <laughs> you helped me pack my Honda Accord, my patty. <laughs> And in 2011, you know, we took that cross country trip together. We video recorded, sent it to our parents and our friends and everything. <laughs> and had a good old time. It's a um, great trip. <laughs> what is it about that trip? Because we both feel like it's monumental. But what was it about that trip that was so significant for you? Well, partly I love that it was you really manifesting the goal that you've been talking about since we were maybe nine or 10 years old. Like you used to pretend you were on TV when we were children. <laughs> and yes, wait. All right, go ahead and tell the story. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, well, no, you tell. <laughs> no, no, no. You okay, tell okay. the story. Okay. Of Miss so, Mary. Yeah. So <laughs> when we were younger, we used to play this game called Miss Mary. We made up this game. Well, essentially, it was hide and go seek in the dark, but you would have to start where somebody was on the floor. And you're like, Miss Mary, Miss Mary. And we would like circle around this person and they would have to get up. And if it, if, if it was a guy, so we had Taj, mm-hmm. your younger brother, uh, we would be like, Mr. Chips, Mr. Chips. <laughs> and they would have to get up and be in the dark and try to find us with their eyes closed. And so uh, this one particular <laughs> time, Taj was Mr. Chips and he was looking for us. And as he was looking for us and he was opening doors with his eyes closed and everything, he basically cut himself with a hanger. And there's a sword that literally there's a scar from here down to here. Yeah. Our parents weren't around. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so Sabrine was like, you know, trying to make sure that we could clean him up. And I'm like, no, but this is a TV show, guys. So, like, we got in the mirror. And I'm like, was, gonna- I think it was ER before there was ER because yeah. you were narrating <laughs> cleaning the wound and like the patient Taj is going to be. You know, he's being such a good patient. We're going to make sure that he's all and in my head. I'm like, I think he needs stitches. We're going to get in trouble. And this was a mistake. And just all of those things. So I'm having a mini anxiety attack and you're just narrating and breaking the fourth wall, talking to the camera in the mirror <laughs> in my bathroom. I was like, I'm like, no, we're going to apply some rubbing alcohol right here. We apply. He's like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> not good. Like, do not try this at home. Um, shout out to Taj. Yeah, shout what out to Taj. Trooper. We love him. Yes. Um, but yeah, even then, anyway, I just wanted to break in because you're <laughs> now that I think about it, you're right. I was always doing those things. Yeah, but you were just always, always on. So it was just funny. I think even then when we were taking the trip, I was thinking back to that moment in the bathroom. You just are, you are 
you are a light, you're a star. So you bring that into you. And I thought it was just great that you're being so brave and moving across the country. It felt like all the other struggle with going to moving around so much with going to Groton and experiencing that kind of isolation. It's like you were training for this. So I was excited to be a part of that for you. And for me, just the idea, you know, driving across country, no matter how old you are, where, wherever you're from, that is a, that's an adventure. And I was so excited to take that adventure with you. You know, we had, we were old school. We had GPS sort of, but we also <laughs> had physical maps. Yeah. <laughs> we relied on those heavily. That's all we, we were like, okay, so route, it was like 60 or something. Like we had yeah. to take one route for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really interesting. <laughs> Really interesting, trying to drive all your possessions or most of your possessions across country and be safe and head on a swivel. But it was really great because I felt so amazing when we got here. <laughs> yeah. I was delirious, but amazing, you know? Yeah, no, I also think about when we were playing Nicki Minaj all the way. We have all these videos of you, like, <laughs> punching the air. Shadow top, boxing. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then also I would say when we would stop at hotels, we would put, garbage bags on the windows mm -hmm. to try to protect my stuff as if that was really like the way to go. Actually, it ends up being a little bit more glaring, I think, that we have stuff in the car. It it made me feel better. Okay. I, I was just trying to we're trying to get peace of mind and give, you know, give our parents some peace of mind. Like we took some precautions. <laughs> Hopefully it, it worked out. So Oh man, no, that was hilarious. So that was that was 2011. Mm -hmm. Um wow. Yeah. So I would say, what, what are some of the most significant shifts that you feel like you've made in your life? I want to say, you know, within the last, I mean, we're closer to 40 now. I know I keep saying that. Mm -hmm. I make folks feel like I'm like an old, ha I'm not, so whatever. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I would say from like 25 on, uh, what do you feel like are some of the most significant changes you've had? I think I like this version of myself the most. Um, I think that I was, I, I look back, I don't feel regret for anything in my youth, but I realize I could have been more, I could have been bolder earlier. That's really the only thing that I reflect on. I think I could have been bolder earlier because now going forward, all I see is every, every idea I come up with, I feel like, yeah, I could do that. You know? Yeah. I when, like toying with the idea of just, you know, trying something new. When we were younger, you wanted to be a chemist. I wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And then Danny wanted to be a lawyer. And that's what, when I was, my first idea for a film, like for everyone kind of at home, and I think you witnessed this, for a long time I wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to cure arthritis. And, uh, mm -hmm. also, and I, I wanted to be a pediatrician and a gerontologist because I wanted to cure my great-grandmother's arthritis. And so during the summer we used to watch now and then all the time. Mm -hmm. And I would always say, oh, we need to do a movie where you become a chemist, Danny becomes a lawyer, and I become a doctor. And that was the very first time that I thought of a script and that was really what made me decide that I wanted to be in like TV and film and really? things like that. Yeah, that was the first time it was like our own story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had, you know, done short stories and stuff like that, but I wanted to do the black version of Now and Then mm -hmm. for years, you know, for a long time. And that's what really, that was like the idea that kind of stuck with me through high school. That's interesting because I thought that originally you thought about doing a, a Dawson's Creek style coming of age. I mean that too. Show. Yeah. I mean it's a different <laughs> different vibe for that because I think the coming of age stories we watched were very sweet and you get a lot of and you get a nice conclusion. Exactly what they said they were going to do, that's what they end up doing. <laughs> but I think that if you were to do a version of a show like that now, how would you how would you write the ending? Hmm. I think Gosh, I don't even think I've gotten gotten to that part, but I would say just being as honest as part as possible and making sure that at least a couple of the characters remain friends. So if you have, I mean, even for us, we had a large group friend circle that I feel like we're still in loose contact with. So I would show all the teenage angst and all of the, you know, insecurities, but also I would bring them, I would bring them through in terms of some of the goals they may have had when they were in high school, I would actually see them through at least one of the characters all the way through to adulthood if they got there. Um, Cause I feel like that's what we did. I mean, I think a lot of the people that we, I mean, I feel like before the end, we'll probably shout out all these people, but I feel like a lot of um, our friends have gone on to do really great things, even though we were, you know, raised in Irvington and Newark, which I think 
most people would say are rough neighborhoods. I feel like we made it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And not just like made it halfway. I think we have become like just really productive citizens (laughs) of the world, if you would say. It's funny that you say that because I, I do agree that that's probably the perception. But I think because there's so many of us, do we just find the most fruitful time in Irvington? It felt like it felt like we kind of grew up on Sesame Street. You and, think so? Oh, uh, to me, I didn't think so. To me, because Sesame Street is still kind of based in an urban neighborhood, but there's good people there. There's good people there doing good things, and they grow up to still be good people. You know, you can still be a good person no matter where you start. Yeah, but I mean, I think the thing that I kind of hold on to a lot is the fact that we're still the same. Like yesterday, we went to my favorite restaurant, home restaurant, mm-hmm. and I ordered what did what did I order? French toast, bacon, and eggs. You've been ordering that for 30 years? Yeah. like In every diner ever? Yeah. <laughs> Whether they have it there or not? Like, and you, like you said yesterday, you were like, that's so Kristen of you. And I'm like, man, most people wouldn't know that. And so I think to just have somebody that's been a part of your life for so long that yeah. can um, look at some of the things that are similarities and differences from back in the day, but can also like hold you accountable. We've never had to check each other in that way, mm-hmm. but I feel like can look at each other and be like, yeah, no, that's the same person that it was that she was when she was younger. Yeah. And can I just say, I appreciate that about you at your core. You've been the same person. But, and I think I've been the same person. We even look, if you look back at our pictures, we make similar facial expressions that we did when we were kids, but you've given me enough space to grow and be this version of Sabrine. Cause it's still Sabrine, but it's, more more bloomed Sabrina. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love so it. I appreciate you for that. I love it. Um, okay, so let's go to we talked a little bit about family. Um, I would say what are what would you say um was one of our toughest moments in our friendship, if you can think of anything? Um strangely enough, I think when you moved to LA, I was very I I felt a deep sadness then because it felt like we were young adults then, and there's no more graduations after that point. There's no more baked in celebrations, you know, unless you go and get married, you have kids and all that other stuff. But even then it's different than when you when you're constantly matriculating. And I think that I felt the same kind of worry just for a little bit that I felt when you went to Groton, like this is the beginning of a new mm. life. I don't feel like our our friendship has degraded. Yeah, no, when you mention that, it's cool because I don't think I've asked you that question before. Um, out of all of my friends, I think that you and I still, this year has been a little bit better, but I feel like we still haven't established like a communication rhythm. I think we're just kind of getting into it because now we're on the same apps. Like for a long time, like now that we're in like just the social media of it all, like we weren't on the same apps. So you, I think WhatsApp, IG, Facebook, I do think those things matter now yeah. because you're able to just send little funny things here and there. But if you're like on different devices and in different industries and in like everything different, like even not just time zones, but your sleep pattern is so different from mine. So we don't always get a chance to communicate. So I would always say like, um, even in all the years that our communication has been different, I still don't feel like we're it we're less tight. You get what yeah. I'm saying? Like I never go, oh, Sabrina doesn't care or whatever. I'm just like, no, I understand we have different lives, like we have different lifestyles. Um, have have you thought a little bit deeper about that or, or no? Yeah, I think about it all the time because it seems strange the person closest to you you sometimes talk to the least. Yeah, that's um, true. But I agree with you. You know, the apps and being intentional about it and just every now and again sending up a smoke signal. Hey, <laughs> how are you? I miss you. I love you. All that stuff really, it it matters. You know, uh, I think we've built up enough time in that, you know, even if I'm not in touch, I'm not out of touch, if that makes yeah. sense to you. So, you know, I'm just grateful for that. Like we've put the years in that we can be... <laughs> Just regular adults, because I know I know friends that are in the same city and still have the struggles mm-hmm. that we have. Like at least there's, I guess, good reason. But we're still trying to be intentional about that. So I think it's, I think we're doing better. Yeah, no, I think so too. I would say I would say COVID years. I think actually 
Yeah. It really helped, actually. Yeah. Um, just putting together, like, movie nights and stuff like that. And Well, I wanted to ask a little bit more. If you were sure. going to do, you know, a coming-of-age tale now, what what version of us or what version of you would you be looking at? Would it be that classic preteen or high school or college or because there's been so many, there's been so many leaps. Mm -hmm. It's like you're making an evolution every four to six years up until now. And even, I guess even, even more so now, but now we're kind of accustomed to them, but like those years in between, which, which version would you do? Um, I feel like I will always go back to the preteen years. There's something really special about those years yeah. because out of all of the, you made a great point, out of all the chapters, I feel like that was the one that was a, the most pivotal in regards to being in a new environment, having to make decisions for myself without my mom, without elders, without my friends around. Also digging in and really, you know, Pulling out some greatness. And what I mean by that is like ninth and 10th grade. We didn't even talk about this. Yes. Ninth and 10th grade, I was really suffering from depression. And I didn't know I was suffering from depression at the time. I was, I felt bullied. And also um, my grades had dropped. I wasn't around you guys. I had developed a stress condition where my nose was bleeding all the time. Uh, and I would call you at like one in the morning at almost every night. And your dad would always pick up the collect call. And we would just hold the phone in silence, like at 13, like 13, 14. And I was just like holding my nose. I was just holding my nose. I was Mm -hmm. like, I hate this. And I just, I just didn't know which way was up at that point. You know, I was very, very unhappy, very unhappy. I didn't feel like I was academically doing well. I didn't have an outlet because they didn't have a dance program. I hated soccer. (laughs) Things that seem very small, but for a young person, when you're stripped of everything, you're stripped of your family and friends, you're in a foreign uh, environment, you don't feel like you're welcome there. You don't feel welcome at home. Uh, So at that time I was, I feel, I always say a shell of myself. I wasn't communicating all that much. Um, what was going actually like, I know we were talking about scripts and stuff, but like, what was going through your head at that time for me or for you both? Like when I would call at one o'clock, like what were you just like, what is going on? I was scared for you. I was scared for you. And I felt, I felt the loneliness, especially when it would just be kind of sobbing on the phone. That was worrisome because you're my normal response or anybody's normal response would be, you got to hold that person, but we can't hug. There's no, you're five and a half hours away and we're kids. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, again, grateful to my dad to allow that because he, he knew that was a deep sadness as well. Because at the same time, when you applied for that program to go away, I applied as well. And I think that it would have been as, as traumatic, if not, well, just, you know, not, not more traumatic. It would have been as traumatic for me mm-hmm. as it was for you. So you were like living out the, the worries. I, it seemed like such a good idea to go to boarding school, to go away, to be a part of this program. Cause it's a great opportunity, but still you're a kid mm-hmm. and you know, and you still need some protection, just a safe place to land. And you, unfortunately you just weren't in the safe place. You had to create your safe place. Yeah. And you and I think you kind of left a legacy of creating a safe space for all those that came behind you. But, you know, the first one through the door catches all the bullets and right. you and you caught a lot. But you I think you really just in talking about how it is when you go back to your high school now. Oh, I, I think you've I think you've changed the environment in a really beautiful way. And I hope that there's people, there's probably people there that have no idea that it's you that made it that way, Mm -hmm. but I'm glad that it is that way now. So it's, it's safer for someone else. Yeah. No, I appreciate you saying that because yeah, that was really tough. I think out of any hard years, I would still say 13, 14, I never want to go back to those (laughs) years again. I went through ninth grade, went through 10th grade. And then after 10th grade, that's when I told my mom, okay, um, I'm done here. And so we took that summer, you know, I was reading all these books 
autobiography of Malcolm X mm-hmm. and Excellence Without Excuse and Running Two Miles and Saying Affirmations. And I got back to school and I was a completely different kid. I was like, I'm about to take Rodden by storm. Like, right. that's all I would say. Like, I was like obsessed by that point. So, yeah, that was what, 15, 16, mm-hmm. where I really started to, um, you know, build what now is their dance program. They had it. They had, you know, they did have a dance program, but just making it bigger and making dance a sport at the time. Like mm-hmm. we had sports requirements. So having the opportunity to do dance and to choreograph and all of that, I really feel like that time really showed me who I am. And that time is still what I call on even now. Yeah. Like, so yeah, just going back to the original question, that's always what I would pull from. Yeah. The teenage years. Yeah. You were like forged out of steel by the time you came out of high school, honestly. And I don't think that, you know, everybody grows from 14 to 18 is a significant time of growth in your life, but you were in the, you were in the trenches <laughs> you, yeah. and you, I think you came through like such an amazing dynamic, like fully vibrant version of yourself. I think that even at your graduation, you were happy, but it had nothing to do with Grant. you were like, despite your best efforts and not necessarily the school, but the environment, mm-hmm. Despite your best efforts, not only did I survive, I've thrived and I and I destroyed some of your some of your things that tried to destroy me. Yeah. So, well, yeah, when you mentioned like going back now, I love I love going back. Yeah. But all those memories flood and even when you would visit and you know, all all I remember everything from yeah. our teenage years and it's so interesting cuz now when I meet young people, I always think about how significant those times are and that they'll always remember those times. A lot of, I feel a lot of folks don't, don't acknowledge how significant those years are yeah. because it really does, at least to me, it, it informed who I am sure. as an adult. Yeah. I think it's informed how you are as like a mentor as well. You're very purposeful in trying to pour into people specifically. And if you see something like, this is what you need to do. This is what is coming ahead. And there's no, there's nothing mysterious about the lesson you're trying to teach. I think you're very intentional about trying to give, I'm trying to give you the keys so you can get here yourself. I would say, thank you for that. I would say that. And I would also say the same of you in a bit of a different way. I think just in regards to how you are with young people, but how you have been with your family, like just, I think filling the gaps at all times and always being present, always being, um, just a shoulder to lean on. Sometimes I think you have too much of a shoulder to lean on, if I'm honest. But I think that it has been amazing to witness and to experience. I'm sure there's something to that. But I think with both of us, I think the experience was, you know exactly what it is that you needed. So you try to be that. Mm-hmm. And I saw something. It's like who you who you are now is who you would have felt safe with when you were younger. And I fully, that resonates with me a lot. Not that, not that you're necessarily unsafe, but exactly what you needed, the internal monologue that's kind of going along when you're in those tough times as a young person. I try to speak to that. And I, and I'm, again, I'm inspired by you, my being purposeful about it. I'm, you know, with family is it's, it's natural, but being purposeful with people that remind you of yourself or don't remind you of yourself or that you just see are struggling. And I know what your struggle is. Yeah. Let me just give you a little something so you can keep going. Yeah. Well, we've seen a lot of people come and go, unfortunately. Um, A lot of friends that haven't made it, your joke, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but also family members that unfortunately haven't made it. But I would say the, like I I said before, the one significant piece in terms of friendship, sisterhood that I have is you. And when I think Mm -hmm. about every single moment in my life, you have always been present. You've always been a champion. Um, man, I'm just so grateful for you. And I'm so excited. We're going to go see Usher, y'all. So. Hey. <laughs> I was waiting for you to bring it up. I was waiting for you to bring it up. <laughs> I was so excited. Um, our road trips, I feel like our seconds and none, they're always so special. We've had what? My graduation road trip after college. We went to Georgia with Vander, mm-hmm. my cousin Vander. We went to Maryland. Yeah. That might have, was that our first one? I think that was the first yeah. one. So our very first one was Maryland where my car broke down. Mm-hmm. And I, it was funny because when we <laughs> left town, I was upset with my mom for some reason about something. I think she told us not to go. Yeah. <laughs> and we were like, we're, we're, like, going, yeah, we're anyway. going anyway. 
And then we end up going and then my car conks out. Yeah. And then thankfully my cousin India, shout out to you, India. Uh, she allowed us, we were going to go visit her anyway, but she allowed us to figure out, I think yeah. we stayed a little bit, a little longer than we had yeah. initially planned. Um, so we had that trip. It looked like you were getting ready to say no, something. No, 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 go on. Okay. So it was that one. Then our trip with Vander mm-hmm. and we ended up having to turn back around. You know, I think, I think someone got, I think, yeah, I think Vander got sick. So we ended up needing to fly to come back. And then our next trip was LA. So I think we were in training for the LA trip before we, before you realized you were coming to LA. Yeah. Because even that you, you've been, you were setting things in motion. Originally we came to LA. I think, was it the first time because you got on wheel of fortune? Yeah. yeah. Finally. (laughs) <laughs> After applying since we were, what, 14 or 15 years old, every version of Wheel of Fortune you tried to get on. And then finally, it happened. And it happened exactly as it was supposed to happen. Yeah. You know, and that was kind of the seed for us taking this trip out here. But it's like all the things that you've been putting in motion have culminated in this version of Kristen, who's, you know, beautiful and dynamic and sweet and powerful and all those things. And I think that it's just really... I'm grateful to be a part of this journey with you. Likewise. (laughs) So, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to make sure to bring Sabrina on the Trust Your Magic is because she has been the main person, uh, the main friend who has been here as I have learned to trust my magic. She has been here through every transition. I think every heartbreak, every inspiration, every script, she has always been here just being the awesome person that she is. So I am honored that Sabrina is here sitting with me, just chatting it up about life. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I appreciate you. I love you too. I love you. If you like what you're listening to and watching, please make sure to subscribe. This is Trust Your Magic, the podcast. We are so excited to have you here and just continue to watch and listen. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.